Tonight's headlines are brought to you by McDonald's. Tonight on the Channel 2 News, a juvenile charged with sexual assault is being tried as an adult. Closing arguments presented this morning. Also tonight, a missing handgun and high-powered rifles are classified as a theft incident. And the feds question over $11 million in COVID money and the NMI might have to pay it back. In sports, the Marianas Cup will stay in the Marianas, but it will stay to the north, and it's a triumphant feeling for the NMI. Stay with us. These stories and more next. Mickey D's McCrispy. Formerly known as the Crispy Chicken Sandwich, now has some respect on his name. Ba da ba ba ba. Real talk. The Spicy Crispy Chicken Sandwich should have been named Spicy McCrispy from Jump. Ba da ba ba ba. A six-person jury made up of four men and two women found Kenneth Thomas Bloss Kaipat guilty on all counts today in Superior Court. Kaipat was on trial for raping a woman four years ago on June 2, 2019. Kaipat faced charges of sexual assault in the first degree, sexual assault in the second degree, aggravated assault and battery, assault with a dangerous weapon, strangulation, and burglary. This afternoon at 4.15 p.m. in front of a packed courtroom, Judge Wes Bogdan asked Kaipat to rise as the verdict was read. Marshals were spread throughout the aisles. One minute later, at 4.16 p.m., the verdict was read count by count, and the jury found Kaipat guilty of all charges. Kaipat is being represented by attorney Brian Sears Nicholas, who did not call any witnesses in the case. Kaipat was a juvenile at the time of the incident, but was tried as an adult. The case took a long time to charge as the NMI waited for DNA test results to be returned. Stephen Kessel and Heather Barcenas prosecuted the case on behalf of the NMI. Uh, it's been a long week, uh, but this does at least bring this some conclusion to the family, to the victim. Uh, also, we just want to say thank you to the men and women from the Department of Public Service for their hard work that went into this case. After the verdict was read, the judge polled each of the jurors independently and asked if this was their verdict, which they each affirmed sentencing will be scheduled at a later date. High-powered rifles and a Glock handgun are missing from the Division of Fish and Wildlife. The finding came in May during an OPA audit. Sylvan Igisomar is the Director of Lands and Natural Resources, and he answers questions about the missing guns. On May 1, I received a, uh, a request for audit survey for firearms uh, within the department, and the only division I have that does handle firearms is Division of Fish and Wildlife. So I instructed the director to provide an inventory of the firearms within the division's care. And uh, when I received it and we went through it, uh, I realized we, uh, I was made aware that uh, nine firearms were missing. Iggy Somar says when they went missing is at this point unclear. How many guns does the department have overall? Like how many, what percentage of overall guns does this represent? 
I can't tell you that off the top of my head. I know that uh, we have an enforcement uh, section under Fish and Wildlife, and then we have the wildlife section that used to uh, conduct animal damage controls in the Northern Islands, and so they had uh, high-power rifles, uh, AR-15s, Mini-14s, uh, types of ammunition and firearms. So some of those uh, rifles when missing um, and one pistol from enforcement is also missing and that's that's quite concerning I, I don't want to even imagine the what that might look like if something bad happened to uh, one of those missing firearms and a member of our community so that's why it was we immediately notified DPS and started figuring out where and what happened. Iggy Somar was previously the director of Fish and Wildlife until 2010. I haven't seen what the standard operating procedure is for Fish and Wildlife in handling these things. As you can imagine, we're still brand new in, in the role. And there's a diverse array of issues that we're dealing with. High-powered rifles were previously used in eradication efforts up in the northern islands. Animals on Surigan and Anatahan were shot as part of an effort to minimize environmental damage from the introduced animals. It was a combination. It's not just officers. It was the folks in the wildlife section and uh, the enforcement, some folks from Rhode and Tinian, some folks from Guam. Uh, the federal partners also participated. So it was a combination, it was a huge undertaking, including members of the DOD that came up and provided support also. Is it possible that these rifles went missing back then? I don't think so. What do you want the public to know? Uh, I would like the public to know that, you know, we are deeply concerned about this, this uh, this matter and we've we're working closely with uh, public safety and all the investigators and I've instructed all my uh, department employees to uh, to cooperate fully as the investigation continues. Division of Fish and Wildlife is overseen by Manny Pangalinen. Pangalinen is currently on leave. Mike Tenorio is the acting director and he answers questions about the gun investigation. Are you involved in that process at all? Uh, at, the, at this point, no. I've been informed about it, and uh, I'm actually just trying to help move things along. The, the guns that the enforcement officers use, uh, the rifles and handguns, what are those, what are those used for? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm assuming it's probably for one of the... Uh, projects that occurred over the years and they were probably being stored and that's as much as I know about that. Okay. Projects like to maybe talk uh, a little bit about... Uh, probably uh, the uh, eradication projects that occurred uh, on Anatahan and uh, I think one of the other islands, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, other other than that, I really, I'm, I'm just uh, being informed along the way, just like everybody else. Is it possible these have been missing for years? Uh, anything is possible. Um, I, I would think you'd probably get more information from DPS once this is all done. Um, honestly, I don't want to um, put any information out that I don't know about. So I, I think I just have to go through the process and meet with the people that I need to meet to regarding this issue. Over $11 million in questioned costs have been identified by the Office of Inspector General related to the CNMI's use of coronavirus relief funds. Finance Secretary Tracy Narita. The question costs are uh, listed in our press release as uh, those pertaining to contracts above 50000 and um, the lack of documentation. The desk audit transmitted to the CNMI Department of Finance on August 9th was performed by Castro and Company, 
and examined the period between March 1st, 2020 and March 31st, 2022. Narita says the Department of Finance takes these desk audit findings seriously and will continue to work with the Inspector General to provide missing documentation and make necessary reporting corrections. She goes on to say that she supports the Inspector General's recommendation for a full scope audit and says this will allow the department and other enforcement agencies to hold government officials accountable for any illegal or unauthorized expenditures of CARES Act funds. The sort of biggest thing that jumps out at you looking at the audit? Is the total amount of question costs. It is significant. 11.1 million is a serious and significant amount of question costs that may have grave impact to the CNMI. Grave impact meaning what? In, in what? What, what are you afraid of? Um, there are, well, one consequence is uh, just our credibility uh, in the, what do, you, what do you call that, the federal um, space, you know, and then also the potential impact for the CNMI to repay those funds. Is this going to trigger anything criminal? There's always a possibility, and that's why we will be uh, working with the Office of Inspector General to gather as much information and documentation that we can find. And if there's any indication um, that it should be referred to the AG's office, it will be done. U.S. Treasury provided a total of just over $36 million in CARES Act funds to the CNMI. The amount that is being questioned amounts to just under a third of the total amount. Mayors from Guam in Saipan this morning and met with Governor Palacios to thank the NMI for support during the aftermath of Typhoon Mawar. I welcome the mayors from Guam. They reached out to me at the very last minute. They wanted to come down and show their, their appreciation and their gratitude for what we did uh, to get the containers over to Guam. The typhoon's powerful winds damaged many homes and wood structures, left hundreds of residents homeless, uprooted many trees and compromised electricity and water services throughout the island. Mayor is reading from a resolution introduced by the Mayor's Council. The CNMI coordinated relief drives collecting cases of bottled water, non-perishable food items, portable stoves, emergency personal effects, pillows and blankets to fill two 40-foot shipping containers worth more than $100,000. Governor Palacios. This is what it's about. You know, when, when, and we, we experience the same disasters too. And I, I believe that it's going to continue. In our recent history, eight years from Sutherlord to Manco to you to uh, uh, the people of Guam also extended a very big assistance to the Commonwealth, the people of the Commonwealth. And you know, it was it wasn't really hard. It was it was just our turn. Overcoming drug addiction was difficult, but I found a way to get my life back on track. Recognizing my addiction was the first step towards my recovery. But that is not always easy living in the scene of my. It was hard for me to avoid things that triggered my addiction. I needed to change my routine. There were some good days and some bad days. But with the love and support from my friends and family, I never gave up. I found my path and I continue to walk it every day. Find the path that works for you. This project was supported by a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Commonwealth Healthcare Corporation. Contents are solely the responsibility of the CHUC and do not necessarily represent the official views of the CDC or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. One of the best addresses in Saipan has office space available now, right in the heart of things. The Marianas Business Plaza offers reasonable rates and can help build to suit your needs. You'll love the central location, just 15 minutes from the airport and 10 minutes from Garapan. Ample and covered parking keeps your vehicle close and protected. 
two restaurants for easy access, lunch, dinner and business meetings. Building security and 24-hour access to your office. Backup generators, so you can run your business in all weather. And three elevators mean easy and convenient access. It's the address in Saipan, the Marianas Business Plaza. Get your goods here with care and attention with Micronesia Air Cargo Services. Max is all about connections, daily flights to and from Guam, four times a week to Rota, and bi-weekly flights to Tinian. We are connecting the Marianas. Perishable goods, Home Depot furniture and appliances, even live animals operating since 2013. Check out our Thursday special to Rota from Guam and Saipan. Call Max at 670-288-6227. If it fits, we'll take it. Boxcar, the plane that took off from Tinian 78 years ago this week to drop an atom bomb on Japan, almost didn't make it back. A faulty fuel pump and unclear weather over the initial target gave the crew a whole host of problems, and they went to plan B, which was to dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. After the drop, the plane was very low on fuel. They made it just to Okinawa before coming in unexpectedly to land on fumes. One engine died of fuel starvation on approach, another engine a few seconds later. Historian Don Farrell. They had pretty much resigned themselves to having to ditch the aircraft. And uh, when they got to Wonton Airport and, and they were literally flying on fumes, uh, they could not get contact with the air tower on Wonton because Wonton was not expecting B-29s, right? They had no idea who was calling them or why, and then all of a sudden, Sweeney, uh, to get their attention, has his crew fire all of the flares on the airplane out these two flare jets. Usually you fire one or two, and it tells the tower if you have wounded on board, dead on board, uh, the damage to the aircraft, uh, um, uh, landing gear won't lock, stuff like that. So they, they fired two or three of them to get their attention and could not get their attention. And finally, Sweeney said, fire them all. And the smoke that backlashed into the airplane filled the airplane. <laughs> Nobody could see anything. <laughs> and they knew they were on last final approach. And so Sweeney just took it in. Farrell says the big question is why Paul Tibbetts, who flew the original mission, did not fly the second. Do you think in retrospect Tibbetts should have flown that second Absolutely. mission? Absolutely. That's what he was hired to do. Never should have been a question in his mind or LeMay's mind or anybody else's mind. That's what he was hired to do, right? Now he picks a non-combat pilot to fly the plane. Why? Why? Well, easy answer to that one. Ego. He had become world famous on August 6th when he dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and his name was in every paper in the world and he was the hero of the Air Force. But the second bomb had a different technology and it wasn't sure that it was going to work. He thinks that is why Tibbetts shied away from that flight. Norman Ramsey, as I wrote in my remarks, um, uh, had said, he, he, I'll get the, plane, the bomb ready for you, but I can only give it an 80% chance. And so I'm quite sure that Tibbetts heard that and realized that he didn't want to have a failure and lose his herodom. Farrell met Tibbetts, also navigator Dutch Van Kirk and weapons system manager Morris Jepsen during a visit to Tinian back in 2004. He had become, uh, I gave him full credit, the fact that he was the single best B-29 pilot in the Air Force. He knew more about the B-29 and its abilities than any other man. And that's why he was recruited specifically for the job of flying that airplane and then training these other men how to fly. It takes time and patience to learn some of the traditional skills like basket weaving and rope making. On Friday at 500 Sales, experts were doing and demonstrating. You cut it and then you try it first, try it under the sun. So it will make the leaves, you know, like uh, more flexible to, to weave it. Mario Benito is originally from Puluat Atoll, located in the western area of Chuuk State, the 
Five Islets has a total aggregate land area of just 3.4 kilometers. It has breadfruit trees in the middle and coconut trees alongside the shores. It's home to about a thousand people and was discovered by the Spanish in 1801. On Friday, a local group gathered to hone up on some of these practiced traditions. I'm doing the uh, men's, men, men's basket to carry uh, breadfruit and coconut. It's a round basket, but he carried on your shoulders. The cuts come towards you. Benito says the kids watch first, and then as they get older, they start doing it themselves. Uh, maybe you tell you start you know, like look at the uh, old man, you know, like weaving, and then you start learning from there. They always, you know, like get together back home, you know, like the men always you know, like get together in their in their man's house, and then do some work like this, either either making this uh, basket or uh, making rope. Rope has lots of uses, and Benito puts it to good use. In March of last year, the master navigator traveled to Tinian by canoe, and in April of last year, he participated in a circumnavigation of Saipan, and that was just a warm-up for a three-month trip that included a trip to Satawal and Palau. Saipan's beaches, this mother lays about a hundred eggs under the cover of darkness. She hides her nest as best she can and then slowly makes her way back to the ocean. The eggs hatch and the babies head for the sea where they will face a daily dose of danger. Just one in a thousand will make it to adulthood. Those that do will one day lay their own eggs. Sea turtles are protected under CNMI law. If you see one that is stranded or if you see illegal activity, call the hotline at 287-8537. Location, location, location. Office space on Capitol Hill available now at the Hermosa Vista Business Park. With natural light and ocean views, it's the perfect place for creative professionals. So upgrade your life and your working environment. Schedule an exclusive showing now. Call us at 670-483-4750 or email hvsaipan at gmail.com. Point of sports fans. Men's and women's soccer players are basking in the glow of the Marianas Cup. The under-23 men's team lost to Guam 1-0 on Thursday, but then they stormed back and take the Saturday contest 3-0. They win the Marianas Cup. Women win on Thursday 5-1 and then come back with a 2-0 victory on Saturday, also winning the Cup. Soccer has come such a long way since its start in 2007. A new facility down in Coblerville with two fields, a short field, artificial grass, state-of-the-art lights. Coach Mita is the technical director and men's coach, and he gives a big thanks to the community. We always like uh, continue to lose the game, right? So, but today, <coughs> so we got so many opportunity to play this kind of uh, high-level tournament, the competition. Then the community and the NMIFA, the President Jerry Tan, Los da Panta, so they set up this perfect opportunity. So we are uh, given a lot from, for the, from the community and the people in NMI. So we wanted something return for them. So boys and we discussed that. So today is the best chance we can return to the community. 
So then boys made it. I'm very, you know, um, yeah, so I'm happy with the boys' performance. And uh, I also appreciate you know, what we are giving from the community and the NMIFA. <laughs>